So we're just going to quickly go over this material and we go into greater depth, of course, in our book, but just to kind of give you a taste, so to speak, of these beautiful books. The next cover is for The Queen's Closet Opened. It was first published in 1655, and you can see that if I read these subtitles, uh, the entire titles of these books, we wouldn't get to anything else. They're always long uh, in the 17th century and even into the 18th century, so I'm only re reading you the short title. Um, its cooking section for the Queen's Closet Opened was called The Complete Cook. That's lovely old orthography there. Um, it was a collection of recipes that were attributed to Queen Henrietta Maria. She was this lovely lady. She was the wife of King Charles I, who was beheaded during the English Civil Wars. Um, and the Queen's Closet Opened was published after the fall of the monarchy and was probably compiled by one of her former servants. Uh, it's, the title page is signed WM. It might be Walter Montague, they think, one of her servants. Queen Henrietta Maria's book was uh, a book of what was called Domestic Secrets, in which um, uh, kind of the expert and elegant recipes of the royal family and the aristocratic class were revealed, in other words, in print. Um, it influenced much of later New England and colonial American cooking. Later in the 17th century, we have this book by a woman named Hannah Woolley, who imitated Queen Henrietta Maria's book, and we can tell she imitated the book by the title. It's called The Queen-like Closet. <laughs> Isn't that good? Now the previous one, The Queen's Closet Open, she's obviously trying to sort of trade on that popularity. This one was published in 1670. Um, she simplified, Hannah Woolley did, the Queen Light Closet, she simplified many of the expensive and complicated aspects of court cooking so that her recipes could be more appealing to a rising middle class, basically, in the later 17th century, um, while still retaining, obviously, a sense of glamour. And this book was very popular. In the 18th century, and we are really whizzing through the periods of uh, time here, we have the increasing... Um, popularity of cookbooks and fancy dishes and a whole new batch of culinary stars. The first one is The Complete Housewife. It was published in 1728 uh, by E. Smith. You can see her name down there. Um, we're not sure of her first name even. We know very little about her. But it was very well received, the book. Following that was probably the most popular cookbook of the 18th century. Just as we all know, know Fanny Farmer, everyone knew the art of cookery made plain and easy um, by Hannah Glass. It was published first in 1747. Um, it's, it's interesting if you go to Britain, uh, British people still know very well about Hannah Glass. She's referred to in The Guardian, you know, Hannah Glass. It, it's just, it, it's, a, it, it's a, you know, a folk legend. People know about Hannah Glass. Bloggers still talk about her. We particularly like this next plucky lady. Her name is right there, obviously, Elizabeth Raffle. We love the way she's handing her book out of the frame to you. It's very charming. Um, this is a frontispiece to her cookbook called The Experienced English Housekeeper. It was first published in 1769. With the help of her husband, who had been a gardener on the estate where she was the housekeeper, Elizabeth Raffold managed her own small cooking empire in the 18th century. She had a cooking school and a highly uh, successful confectionery shop in Manchester, England. All the best people came there to buy cakes and pies and such. The creation of the modern wedding cake, and we really like to emphasize this, most people think wedding cakes just always were not so. The creation of the modern wedding cake can be attributed directly, really, oh, I went a little too far. Um, to her. There she is. I'll show her again. She published a recipe for something something called bride pie, and it caught on. It's actually very like our wedding cake today. Before that, if you had a festive uh, wedding occasion, you had a. Um, uh, she pu did I say bride pie? She she published bride cake, which was a lot which is a lot like our cake today. But before Elizabeth Raffled, if you had a wedding, you had a bride pie. We're glad she was doing it. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I, I have a hard time with this clicker. I'm sorry. Okay, here we are. 
Um, now, these British cookbooks were all imported into New England during the colonial and early national periods, um, and they are rarely mentioned in histories. Uh, I, I don't remember ever hearing about a cookbook in any of the history classes I took. Um, and one of the things that's uh, interesting to us about what's not mentioned is when we hear about Paul Revere, and as New Englanders, we all know about Paul Revere, very few of us know that he did engravings for a cookbook. These are engravings by Paul Revere. He did engravings for a cookbook, a 1772 edition of a British cookbook by a woman named Susanna Carter. It was called The Frugal Housewife. Um, what's particularly interesting to us about that is in 1772, so close to the um, rupture with Great Britain, he was basically promoting a British cookbook. Um, New England food has, food in general has received scant attention by historians. New England food in particular has received scant attention uh, by historians. We think the reason is the popular assumption is that Puritans didn't eat well. They ate plainly and austerely and poorly. But we feel this assumption really needs to be challenged when we look at the cookbooks themselves. The operative principle um, that Puritans applied to matters of diet was in essence the same one they applied to matters of business. And we know that we know they did very well in business indeed. And that assumption was that you could pursue an activity or an interest, any pursuit as much as you wished, as long as you pursued it, keeping in mind that it didn't distract from your spiritual quest in the world. So the leading minister of Massachusetts, uh, John Cotton, could write that to cheer our bodies with food and drink was no sin. Uh, as so long as the congregants did not, as he put it, terminate in eating and drinking. Don't make it an end in itself. So, but go right ahead. They have plenty of good things to eat. And they did from the sales of these cookbooks. And we can tell. So the enjoyment of, re of refinement and luxury was perfectly accept acceptable to Puritans and to their 18th century um, descendants and 19th century descendants. To illustrate the New England interest in refinement in diet, they were particularly interested in seeming to be refined people, we um, have in our book an illustration of a uh, teapot. You can see it's very beautiful. It's from the uh, middle period of the 18th century. It's in the collection of the Newport Historical Society. We were lucky enough to get a, pic a picture of it. Um, it provides evidence of the popularity of rituals of gentility, like tea drinking and tea making. Ideas about refinement in eating spread from the upper classes down. For instance, the first house plan in the colonies to include something that was design and color coordinated, a space that was set aside particularly for the performance of gentility and was called a dining room. The very first dining room in New England what dates from 1681 in Boston. And of course that would be because it was the region's uh, capital center. But by the 1740s, Porcelain teapots and cups could be found even in moderately wealthy homes, in, um, for instance, in Worcester County. Despite the spread of luxury, mixed feelings did persist about lavish dining because the, the Puritans did have a, a, you know, a, a certain tradition of austerity. Um, and they persisted in both England and New England through the 18th century. And for instance, Hannah Glass, who we mentioned earlier, had the most popular cookbook of the 18th century complains about the kind of cooking that was always associated with being too luxurious, which is French cooking. She complains about French cooking and its influence on the English diet. French modes of cooking were considered synonymous not only with luxury, but also among many English people and the colonists and you know, people here. It was, it was a, a form of trickery, not just luxury, but trickery. Um, fancy sauces would disguise poor cuts of meat. You know, what were these French cooks up to? Um, so she writes in her preface, this is Hannah Glass now, so much is the blind folly of this age that gentlemen would rather be imposed on by a French booby than give encouragement to a good English cook. But censure didn't stop her, interestingly, from including many French-inspired recipes in her cookbook. Um, they include things like truffles, morels, you know, fancy mushrooms, um, artichoke bottoms, all of the popular French items. The ambivalence uh, between a desire to display culinary refinement and luxury 
and an appreciation of the virtues of simplicity and plainness continued with American independence. In 1796, America finally got its own cookbook titled American Cookery by a woman named Amelia Simmons. We'll be showing you some dishes from this book as we cook them ourselves later in the, in the presentation. American Cookery is an unassuming, paper-bound, 48-page book. I do. I do want the time page. I'm sorry. There it is. Uh, and you can see her kind of signature there. Um, it made a very big impact uh, when it was published. It went quickly through many editions. That's one way you can tell it was popular. It was plagiarized. That's another way you can tell. Uh, people took whole sections of it, of it and published it under their own names. They liked it so much. Um, and uh, it was so fashionable. With the introduction of American cookery, this cookbook, American-style cooking became so fashionable that subsequent editions of English cookbooks printed in England had to have American appendices. It, you know, it became a fad to have American um, uh, dishes. Amelia Simmons, uh, we don't know very much about her except what she tells us in the preface to her book. She does say uh, that she was an orphan, and you can see on the title page, under her name, an American orphan, which is very interesting. She makes a big point of saying that she learned to cook as a way to make a determination of her own, meaning to make her way in the world as a poor woman, as someone who wasn't being uh, supported by her family. Uh, it's quite an interesting book. Um, through American Cookery and Amelia Simmons, the world was first introduced to a number of American-style recipes. Custard pumpkin pie is one of them. There was an English, uh, an English pumpkin pie, but it wasn't the custard pie we all know at Thanksgiving. Uh, we've made it, it's delicious, kind of fell out of favor, but there was a pumpkin pie, but it was fried slices of pumpkin layered with uh, a kind of fried egg called a froise, herbs, and uh, wine in the mix. But the custardized pumpkin pie is from Amelia Simmons. She was the first to popularize the Dutch term cookie. Um, here's a recipe page on the left that we use as, as an illustration from her book that we use as an illustration in ours. You can see that actually in these two recipes, you can see the world of, of English and American cooking. The top recipe is a classic American pumpkin pie. Uh, she spells it pumpkin. Um, puddings in pastes was the name for custard pies at the time. So if it says pumpkin pudding, and you put it in a paste, it's a pumpkin pie. If it's orange pudding and you put it in a paste, it's an orange custard pie. The top recipe is an American um, indigenous kind of pumpkin pie. So we've made it. It's very like our pumpkin pies today with locally grown foods, you know, uh, eggs, uh, pumpkin and such. The bottom recipe is um, an English recipe. It was actually, this is an example of of Simmons herself plagiarizing. It's a direct steal from Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy. She copied the recipe right from Glass. And it's an English recipe we know. It's considered elegant to use a tropical fruit that would be more expensive. So if you served an orange pie, you're serving something kind of fancy. Um, OK, moving on. With the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, the tensions of cooking styles that we've been outlining between luxury on the one hand, simplicity and restraint on the other, were only heightened. Mechanization brought a cornucopia of goods to the marketplace, but mechanization and the Industrial Revolution also brought with it, for the first time in many people's lives, the experience of, of an economy of boom and bust. Uh, that had, you know, an agrarian economy was, was more even keel. And here was an economy of boom and bust. To cope with the insecurity, this writer, Lydia Maria Child, who, by the way, is from Medford. Um, and so she was Fanny Farmer, by the way, so we had <laughs> yes, three, right. three cooking luminaries. Yes. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> See? See? Well, Fanny uh, uh, Lydia Child is an absolutely wonderful person. We, we, we would happily devote the whole evening to her. Fabulous woman. She, uh, but we, we can't obviously, but she wrote a cookbook among other things. She was an abolitionist, uh, abolitionist, a novelist, very well known for that. She was also the author of the Thanksgiving song, Over the River and Through the Wood. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, her book, 
is called the American Frugal Housewife. And it was an effort to address the kind of boom and bust economy, especially the bust aspect of it, to address frugality, to say to women, if you learn to do more for yourself, you'll be able to even out this cycle in your family, and they will experience less hardship when times get rough. And that was really the point of her cookbook. Um, and it was published in 1829. One historian has said that in the 1830s, the majority of the nation's adult female population had read this book. So it's worth knowing about. Now that's about all I'm going to say about luxury and refinement right now. I'll turn it over to Keith and I'll be back at the end to show you some pies. It is like the high school you know, relay team and track where they put the best runners in the first lap and the last lap. And then my job in the middle is to not lose too much of the lead that the, the, the best runner has gotten in the first lap. Okay, well, I'm, my assignment is to begin by telling you about a, a, this woman here who is kind of the polar opposite of Lydia Maria Child in terms of her attitude towards um, the Industrial Revolution and all the changes that it was bringing. Her name is Sarah Josepha Hale. Uh, she was the longtime editor of the most popular woman's magazine of the 19th century, Goldie's Ladies Book, um, a certain combination of McCall's and uh, Vogue. Um, uh, and she kind of really celebrated the, uh, the Industrial Revolution and all these wonderful, even more consumer goods than the 18th century had, uh, than the 18th century consumer revolution had brought about and spread them more widely in society. And she thought that was just great. She didn't see any problem with what child called uh, luxury. Um, and she wrote several cookbooks, um, including two that we draw on for recipes in our book. This one, published in 1839, The Good Housekeeper. And this one here, published in 1853, The Lady's New Book of Cookery. Um, she, um, besides, so, and in terms of the Industrial Revolution, she um, was a big advocate of the changes in technology that were happening in the household, especially the most important one being the switch from hearth cooking, which was taking place all through from about 1825 to uh, right through the middle of the 19th century to coal-fired or wood-fired uh, cook stoves, uh, much more convenient for people. She was all in favor of that. Uh, at the same time, she was one of the leading advocates of, or of um, this idea that's exemplified by this illustration, the idea that the home should be, with all the changes that were going on with, uh, in society and all the kind of rough and tumble of that, that the home was kind of the woman's special uh, domain that she was kind of the presiding person there and it was a kind of a, a haven of refinement and gentility and tenderness uh, it, it, you know as compared to the somewhat uh, as I said more rough and tumble world outside so um, there's a little bit of a tension there if not contradiction between advocating that idea but also advocating that all these changes that were happening in the larger society should actually change the home too with things like the new uh, cook stove. Uh, that was a contradiction that ran pretty deep through um, 19th century culture, and we don't have time to explore it in detail tonight, but um, uh, it, is, it is an interesting issue. Anyway, the next major figure that we um, are going to tell you about is this woman here. Her name is Catherine Beecher, and she's the older sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, and in her day, she was as big a celebrity as her younger sister became after Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, she wrote, and she was a, a big expert on domesticity and running a household. And in the course of doing that, she published one cookbook, this one here. And you can see by the title of it what a celebrity she was. The publisher thought that having her name in the title would help to sell the book. Uh, you know, Martha Stewart's this, that, and the other, Miss Beecher's domestic um, sequel. Uh, she really saw no problem at all. She, she, her, her, one of her big ideas was um, emphasizing that nothing secures ease and success in housekeeping so much as system in arranging work. She thought that uh, too many women were kind of not really well organized enough, were, were a little bit chaotic in how they did their households. And so she was taking this idea that was kind of prevalent in the Industrial Revolution of a sort of a semi-scientific approach to things saying that should be applied to the household too, but she didn't see any, any problem between 
that outlook and also the home as, as a center of gentility and refinement and tenderness, like Hale also said. Uh, for example, she thought that by adopting this more systematic approach to housekeeping, uh, women would be better able to bring off some of the important rituals of, uh, of a refined home, like dinner parties. She has a whole um, chapter in her cookbook on directions for dinner and evening parties, and it includes this um, diagram of how you're supposed to set the table, in which every step to be taken, exactly where to put everything, is spelled out you know, with total precision. So much so that you can see that items X and Y there, the host and the hostess, are placed on a par with the scalloped oysters and the uh, parsnips and the pickles. Um, so anyway, she was very influential. And after the Civil War, uh, this kind of combination of a sort of semi-scientific approach and an emphasis on uh, refinement and gentility became a whole movement that was called the Domestic Science Movement, um, uh, which had its, one, of its, one of its major institutions was in something called the Boston Cooking School, which is kind of fancifully illustrated here from this popular magazine of the, the late 19th century. Uh, the, and the Boston Cooking School, through um, cooking classes, newspaper columns, and cookbooks written by its uh, leaders, which included uh, a, a woman named Maria Parloa, another one named Mary Lincoln, and the one that you heard of that I uh, mentioned with the, another one of the Medford triumvirate, Fanny Farmer, um, they, they uh, emphasized this, what they called scientific methods of cooking. Uh, for example, uh, it was through them that recipes in the form that we now know them in cookbooks, they, they're the ones that started that. Uh, it's not quite in the column form that we know, but in which you, you spell out exactly what the ingredients are, exactly how much of each ingredient, and then you say exactly what step to be taken. That's the highlighted part of the top. And now, equally emphasizing with that, the domestic science movement emphasized gentility, again, in, a, in an almost a formulaic way. So like this recipe, this is from that woman, Maria Parloa, I mentioned. She's telling you exactly what kind of china to put your um, you know, eat this, this fish dish uh, into, and you know, when you're taking the bones out, make sure that it keeps its shape so, so that the presentation will be really good when you bring it to the table, <coughs> just this heap of you know, fish scraps on the, in your nice stone china dish. Um, uh, another component of the uh, post-Civil War culture and cuisine, uh, another movement, and in this movement, Catherine Beecher's sister was a big inspiration, was the colonial revival movement. Um, uh, and that, not time to go into it in detail, but the colonial revival kind of claimed or stated that um, the society that existed was a movement of nostalgia, that the society that existed before the Industrial Revolution was really a wonderful way of life. Um, but of course, nobody really wanted to sacrifice all the convenience and abundance that had been brought in by the Industrial Revolution, so that when they revived aspects of colonial life, including food, what they tended to do was figure out ways uh, to... Okay, well, moving on from pig's head cheese, we just quickly tell you that we did, we, we feel the need to cook most of the recipes in the book. We've done maybe, how many, half? almost a half. The day we did pig's head cheese, um, and a couple other things with the tribes, and we put the shades down so hard, and we live close by our neighbors, and they would see what, what are these crazy people doing with the pig's head in the pot, you know? We had to buy a big pot, it's a big thing. We only, even just a half a head, very large. Anyway, enough with the pig, I, we did it. Um, but it's actually, it is really just deli meat. It's, you know, it's the cheek meat, sort of like the bullet's cheek that we showed earlier. Um, okay, so on to um, Lydia Maria Child again from The Frugal Housewife. The first recipe to show you in the pie section uh, is um, an apple pie. Since English settlement, uh, since this, in other words, since the English came and settled the region, apples have been imported, uh, into, New, imported into New England and important to New England. Um, because the soil and climate here are particularly suitable for apple growing, and as we all know, 
growing up reading about the first settlement, not much was suitable for growing. So they could grow apples well, they did grow them in abundance. Um, and they had many, many apple-based recipes. We give a number of apple pie recipes in our book uh, to Pippin Tart. And by the way, Pippin Tart is also from the, the first English cookbook we showed you from Gervais Markham. We have a um, copy handout on how to cook that. And uh, it's another recipe that the settlers of North Reading might well have known of. So that's why we've included that tonight. And Marlboro Pie, we also um, are going to be showing you. And we have a handout on that, yeah. too, Yeah, for a little bit later. The Pippin Tart um, uh, is delicious. But this recipe um, is for Lydia Maria Child's 1833 apple pie. And it's really a classic. It's just a tremendously good recipe. Um, it, it, it's very basic, and that was that was mentioned before that she was emphasizing frugality, that she was emphasizing getting all American women to learn how to cook in their homes. Um, we go into this in greater detail in the book. We won't tell you all of this, but part of the reason she wrote the book was with the settlement of the Midwest and the West, and people moving into cities from farms. A lot of young housekeepers did not really know how to cook. And they didn't have the women in their family around to instruct them. So she was kind of playing the motherly role in instructing them how to make pie. So this pie um, calls for, by the way, uh, stewed apples, which is there, a little bit of sugar, not too much. These recipes were light on sugar because sugar was expensive. It doesn't include vanilla ever because it wasn't until the late 19th century that, that um, vanilla was produced commercially. The way to grow vanilla beans and to grow and um, processed vanilla uh, into the liquid form we know it did not come around until the late 19th century. So people um, seasoned or, or kind of perfumed their foods with rose water, orange water, and brandy were the most common spirits and um, also grated lemon rind. You can go on, Keith. We used for this pie um, a crust by another great cook, a really great cook named Mrs. A.L. Webster, the improved housewife. As you notice, most of the, these, these cooks of the 19th century were expert at pie making and crust making. And many of them include two kinds of fat, which I think most of us know make a flakier crust. So she has, uh, in, the, in the foundation dough, she has lard, um, which is a little bit of, of sugar. And then she rolls it out and adds butter. You can go on, I think. Um, and there's the crust rolled out. You keep going. There's the apples that have been stewed. You dot it with butter. It's a very deep pie. You put on your top crust and you bake it. That's beauty. Yeah, that was good. You can see that's a lovely pie. Um, so fruit pies, and there it is on the plate. Okay. Fruit pies do have a long history in New England, especially, as I mentioned, apple pies. And this is the tart from Gervais Markham, Markham from 1615. It's called a Pippin tart. Pippins are a type of apple. You can get them in the fall. We bought some at a, um, an orchard in uh, central Massachusetts. I forget the town. No. Phillipston, Massachusetts. You can't get them at farmer's markets. Pippin's a beautiful little apple. A, a pretty good substitute is what we used here. It wasn't the time of year to get pippins locally. They have a very short season, so we use the Granny Smith. Um, it's very simple. The, the base is a puff paste uh, pastry. You cut the core, quarter the, uh, half the apple, cut it in half. Um, put whole cinnamon, a little bit of butter, and you can go on keep. Sprinkle it with a little sugar. Put the top crust on, and that's it. And it's dense and very appley, not very sugary. And it's really delicious. There it is in the pan. It's really a lovely thing. Um, because sugar was very expensive, it was used more like a seasoning or a spice. And so she, he has us sprinkle the sugar on top. OK, we're making everybody hungry, so we'll go quickly. This is Marlboro pudding. Um, and we do have a recipe for this, a handout for this to give you as well. And we've also blogged it, so you can look at how we cooked it on the blog. And it's, a, it's, it's a really a shame that this pudding, uh, this pie, custard, it hasn't um, stayed around, isn't, isn't sold in, in restaurants and, and cooked in New England because it's absolutely scrumptious. It's a custardized apple pie uh, and with wine flavoring, and it's really a beautiful pie. So we're hoping that there'll be a revival of the Marlboro pie. Marlboro, by the way, is a fancy name that was given to the pie to make it sound English. It's an American invention. <laughs> it's just like Downton Abbey. 
They, did, they were doing the same thing. Well, we know how to make it sound fancy. We'll call it a marble pie. So there it is. Keep going. Um, of course, we had to show you a cherry pie. Um, and I've completely lost track of whose pie this is. A child. Oh, it is. This is a child cherry pie. And there's the top crust going on and making it. These are all, we, we do reproduce the original recipes for these um, dishes in Northern Hospitality. Um, and, but you can get, you can also, you know, just look up probably online and find out where to get these recipes too. Okay, keep going, keep. We have a blueberry pie, again, a very simple and lovely pie. Uh, Yankee Magazine blogged this one for us. So if you go to our website, we have a link to Yankee Magazine and how they cook. And it's a great classic. Obviously, the Winkman pie, we don't have to tell you that. I can tell you all the Winkman cooks. Um, totally lost it. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is a funny pie. Um, a very popular sort of fad of the um, period was to put a teacup in the middle of the fruit pie to trap the juices under the cup. And actually, as, as it, it, thermodynamically it works, the juices kind of flow under the cup. The trouble is, and you, we can go on, you can see me, it's a, I use blackberries, you can see me putting the top crust on. We called it a Vesuvius pie because you see <laughs> Well, but the trouble is, yes, the juices are under there, but how do you get the darn teacup out? <laughs> so here I am struggling with this big hole in the middle of the pie. But if you ever want to do something fun with, you know, children or grandchildren, that would be a great project. And it was very popular little idea. This is a great pie. Um, this was actually a peach pie. It's um, the original recipe calls for whole peaches. I'll find it. It's a Mrs. Mrs. A. L. Webster pie. Um, she says to um, keep the pits in because they impart an agreeable flavor. Well, the agreeable flavor they impart in the peach pit is actually cyanogen molecules, which we know is. Cyanide. So this is a cyanide peach pie. <laughs> but you know what? It's absolutely delicious. We both ate it. I got it to eat this pie. He's here to testify. Um, it calls for whole peaches. Uh, you know, just just clean them, wash them, don't don't peel them, don't pit them. Nothing. Well, we could not find for the life of us a deep enough deep dish pie. These ladies were making deep dish pies. So the deepest dish we could find, we had to cut them the peaches and have to fit them in. Um, but we did retain the, the pits. We just put a little sprinkling of flour over the top, a tiny sprinkling of sugar, that's what's on top. And this is our tennis ball pie, you can see. <laughs> and here it is baked. And that would be a really fun one to make in a family setting too, you know. And there it is on the plate, and we vlog this as well if you want to know how what our experience was in making it. And you know, the pe the pits fall out. Uh, the, obviously, the peaches cook down, and it's really scrumptious and delicious fruit pie. And you just move the pits aside on your plate as you're eating. Okay. Okay. Now to the plum cake, with which Helena had mentioned uh, retains the B plum cake, and it was spelled that way. Um, the plums in plum cake, when someone says the job that they got was a plum, they don't mean it's a fruit, P-L-U-M, uh, plum. What they mean is it's, it's, you know, it's special, it's a treat, it's a really good thing. So the plums in the plum cake are um, all of the dried and candied fruit and the nuts. That's the plum in plum cake. Now, as you can notice, um, this is from Amelia Simmons, the first American cookbook. Um, it's made, it, you look at the size of this cake. It's made with 21 eggs, <laughs> so a quart of new ale yeast, um, half a pint of wine, on and on it goes. Well, obviously we don't have a uh, an oven. You know, we don't have a kitchen that could that could accommodate a cake this size. The, people were baking maybe once or twice a week when they were firing their hearth ovens. Um, very complicated to fire a hearth oven. Um, makes a, a great heat, but it's not easy to do. And they were also cooking for large households. They often had not only their extended family, but they had household workers, they had servants, they had farm hands. So when they were making food, they were making it in large quantity. Many of the recipes do have to be cut down a little bit, especially before the 19th century. So um, we cut the recipe in half, and what we're serving tonight is half of the half. So in the cake that we'll be, show, we'll be sharing with you this evening. So you can just see what an amazing size this originally was. Okay, you can go on. Um, 
By the way, there's no sugar in this recipe. Um, it, the, the only sugar is what's sweetening the dry fruits and, um, and in the, the Madeira wine, which is a sweet sherry. So here are the ingredients. For, the, for this cake on the screen, I um, candied my own orange peel, but you can now get, there, we have a company, Nuts Online, that, that will deliver candied fruit all year long, and it's very good quality, it's organic. So you can get it other ways um, during the year than doing it yourself, but we didn't do the citron. We couldn't find a, you know, a citron. I suppose I could have done watermelon, but you can candy fruit, it's not hard to do. But anyway, there are the ingredients. There's the uh, candy fruit going in, um, the wine, the Madeira, and the heavy cream, and the eggs. There's no butter in this cake. There's the, the flour, and the yeast, and there's making the two cakes in a, in a ring. They would have made it with a hoop, a ring. Um, we let it rise, uh, uh, you know, sit a little while because it has both yeast and eggs. Went into the oven, and then there they are. So that's a lovely cake to me. And that's fun. It's a, it's a heavy cake you'll see tonight, but it's, it's fun to make too. Okay, and we did also vlog that. Here it is on the plate. Okay, this quickly again is Catherine Beecher. We've met her before, and these are her Boston cream cakes. You can go on here. Um, the Boston in this title, again, like the Marlboro pudding, it's to emphasize elegance. If it's a Boston something, then it's a fancy something, and you're going to want to cook it. So it's Boston cream cake. It's basically a stolen recipe from the 19th century fresh, French chef uh, Antoine Carême. They're basically, um, you can keep going, they're, they're cream puffs in essence. There's the butter and flour. We'll just go through it quick. It's, as you might know for a pot of paste, you really cook it twice. So it's got the hot water into the flour and butter. Um, there are the many, many eggs going in. She says uh, you can, uh, 12, 6 to 12 eggs as you can afford. We found that day we could afford 12. <laughs> <laughs> and they went. There's the dough. And it makes a lot of cream cakes. You drop them tea, uh, teaspoon size, or I mean um, teacup size on the, on the dish, and then bake them. They are filled. There they are. We have many, many more on our counter. With her mock cream, which is basically a pastry cream. Um, it's eggs and sifted flour. And again, you notice that the flavoring is rose water essence of lemon. That was before, lem uh, before vanilla. And that we have, you can buy rose water now in especially East Asian um, Indian uh, grocery stores. And it's a lovely flavoring. We, we got tasty. some for various dishes we were making. We, we, our son lives in Cambridge where we couldn't get it in Rhode Island. He lives in Cambridge where there's lots of Indian mm -hmm. stores, but we didn't tell him how much to get, and he went and bought two bottles of it, so we have enough for about the next 25 years. <laughs> 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 he's, not, he's not a baker. <laughs> okay, so on you go. And this is how you make it. It's really just a pastry cream. That's the rose water. If you could just go back one. Um, that's the rose water. Got two, that's two that size. And you really only need a little bit like you would for, for vanilla. So it's eggs and milk and a little bit of sugar and flour, a um, little bit of salt, and it makes a pastry cream. You can keep going. You heat the milk, you beat the eggs with the flour, you mix it in, and then you cut open the Boston cream cakes and you fill it with the mock cream, as this feature calls it, and you serve them up for tea. Don't they look nice? Oh, and I guess we vlogged this one too. That was tea time. Okay, we're almost to the end here. I know we're all getting hungry. Um, this is a, a cider cake. Um, it's by Lydia Maria Child and so simple and so good. Um, it calls for one and a half pounds of flour, six cups of flour, a cup of sugar, a stick of butter, half a pint of cider, which is a cup, um, a little bit of pearl ash. Um, that was the, 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 the kind of chemical leavener um, before baking soda, so you can use baking soda for that. And then spice to your taste, we used about a half teaspoon of cinnamon and cloves. And we baked it in two buttered um, loaf pans. And then cool it. She says, bake till it turns easily in the pans. One of the lovely things about reading the old recipes is you get the lovely old diction as well. They really have a way with words. Okay, so this is a tour of our um, interest in historic recipes, and thank you for sharing that interest tonight. You've been a great audience. Yeah.
take a look at the, uh, the books. We have an earlier book about uh, New England food called America's Founding Food. Our most recent one is New England Hospitality. They're in the back. And we uh, have a website, as we mentioned, and this blog that we try to get to when we ever can. So, um, and we have Plum with a bee cake. We hope you join us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, absolutely. If you'd like to um, uh, ask any questions now, we can also continue chatting over cake. It looks like you have a lot of success with some of these complicated recipes. Have you ever had any complicated? <laughs> oh, you would have to that. <laughs> Things happen with um, Kate's hat or either. something, one of these, let's say, esoteric ingredients. <laughs> I wouldn't say that we've had any disasters. Um, we've had some dishes that we have quite, quite as well as others, but not very many. Say. Mm -hmm. No, we made a hog's uh, white pudding, which is, is basically um, variety meats of the hog that you grind up, and the dog got a lot of that, just because <laughs> that's tough. It's just, but there was nothing wrong with it. You know, it's a sausage. You make it only with. The innards of the, oh. um, yeah. yeah, and even at the time of this recipe, which was the E. Smith cookbook from the early 18th century, she has other recipes in her cookbook where they say to mix these kind of funky parts with, you know, <laughs> real, you know, pork meat. Or, yeah. you know. So having just just the variety meats was um, a, little, a strong flavor for us, um, but you know, it came out okay. I mean, it came out fine. We we're what, what we've done with the recipes is just decided to have fun. You know, if it comes out, it comes out. If it's weird, it's weird, like with the teacup pie. So um, luckily we're at a point in life where we don't have a lot of children waiting for supper. So it's okay to do that. But it's been, you know, it's been pretty successful. If you, if you kind of get in the habit of how they're writing the recipes, you get an idea of what they mean, you, you can pick it up pretty well. Mm -hmm. Good. Pretty big pans for seven pounds. Wow. And, yeah. and is it actually going into an oven? It's going into a beehive brick oven mm -hmm. that they have put loads of uh, firewood in and they, oh. they've burnt it down to coals. Mm -hmm. They've swept it out many hours of, of heating that oven. The brick ovens that you see, I mean, it's not like Bertucci's. The fire isn't live and the food goes in. No, the fire comes out. And that oven has been heated white hot. It's swept out. The food instantly goes in. The door is on. They sometimes seal it with, with clay. And it stays in there in what's called a falling oven. So, you know, as it's, it's hot, obviously, at the beginning, there's no temperature control. And the temperature goes down. So as things cook, you put the things in that need the heat first, the hottest heat. You take them out quickly, you put in something else. Quickly, you put in something else. You end up with your custards, which are in small plates and don't need as much heat. So but you really use that heat. When we made the plum cake, for example, or most many most cakes that we have made from you imitate the falling oven by, you know, turning the, every so often turning the temperature down on your, your own oven. Yeah. Um, Just wondering, because you did mention it, but when did recipes start being put into columns? Because you're Fanny so used Farmer to seeing did that. I mean, it I is much easier to She's also the first one to really get a, be a stickler about the quantities and say that a teaspoon meant a level teaspoon and, you know, really stick to it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? I was wondering about the meaning of the word chowder. Doesn't it come from the French? Yes, well, they, they think it might come from the word chaudrière, is that right? Or chaudrée, yes. Chaudrée, the kettle. And the kettle. when the they kettle. made it like a stew, mm -hmm. that it was reflective of something else entirely, and we've adapted the word to yes. uh, describe what is soup. That's right. Yes, that's right, exactly. exactly. It was it was much more of a, I mean, I, they. No one knows for sure, but I think most people think that it originated as a, you know, the equivalent of um, pour, uh, 
succotash or pottage for seagoing, for sailors on, on voyages and everything. Um, uh, you know, some something hardy that you know would sustain people, uh, and, and uh, it continued to be a really substantial, heavy-duty meal right on through the 19th century. Uh, I think it probably is fair to say that clam chowder coincides with the seashore being a place of a vacation spot rather than a workaday place. Um, that that. At least chronologically, the shift from fish chowder to clam chowder coincides with the time when you know sea, the seashore as a place for tourism became was becoming popular. But it was cooked in a kettle, and it, we showed you the crust on top. Um, what they what's recommended is that you put hot coals. It would be over a hearth fire your kettle, and you put a a cover on the kettle, an iron cover on the kettle, and you put hot coals on top of the cover, and that's what would brown your crust. Mm -hmm. well, so you can do that way to use an oven. I was just thinking, um, I lived in England for most of the 80s, and the, most of the cookbooks over there are not found. Um, I mean, they use the measurements are in weight versus yes. volume. So yes. you don't have cups, and you don't have teaspoons. Right. It's a gram. Well, now it's, now it's a gram this and so much that. So, it's very weird cooking with your life because you have to buy a scale. Well, actually, you have to buy a scale for a lot of these recipes because the it, it is actually more more the case. Well, they were using English books, but also they were cooking by weight. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to say about that that um, you know when I make the plum cakes, I do it by weight, and you know once you get used to it, it's just another thing you do. You just mm -hmm. put a piece of wax paper on the on the scale, and you put your flour on there, and there you have it. Mm -hmm. But the yes. handout that we have has a... Yes, I've converted it to, because I know most people use cups. Just back to chowder, just for a second. There's a famous chapter in Moby Dick called Chowder, uh, which makes you very hungry after you have read it. And it's about uh, Ishmael and Quipreg going out to, uh, I think, they're in Nantucket at New, that time. New Bedford, I think it is. New Bedford, before they had left on their big dance oh, yes. voyage for the great, great yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. England. It, 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 it would have been one of these hearty fish chowders. It actually goes through the recipe. Yeah. Oh, we should look at that again. Yeah, really, really, really read, read, read that. It's a short chapter. Yeah, we will. Yeah. 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 I'd love to. Now, do you entertain a lot with all this food? We you have, we have things. <laughs> We have brought things over. <laughs> Those cream cakes just didn't end. Um, and we, we, uh, you know, we have our, our family in the Boston area, so we're often taking pies across state lines and sharing them. <laughs> We've done Thanksgiving dinner with recipes from our book for them, and for the most part, they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we made we made a, um, a, a stuffing recipe called for suet, which they weren't familiar with, so some of them were not totally mm -hmm. pleased with that. But, um, it's, it's actually a great thing to cook with. It's just another form of fat. I mean, it's yeah, very it's tasty. Mm -hmm. To get over the idea. Yeah, the birds like it. No, yeah. It's actually fine. That. It's, that's right. It's fine. Okay, well, we hope you'll join us for something. Thank you very much.